Greetings and welcome to Astronomy at Hack. As I over the winter break here, I'm recording a few little videos for you for some extra um, extra special topics, just some areas that may have some need of a little bit more explanation. And I did this over the summer, but I recorded all audio. This time I'm going to try recording some videos for you. And you'll see me writing up on the screen here. Yeah, I could do it. Uh, I could print them out and type it out and make it look really pretty. But I think the better idea is to bring it a little more what it would be like in the classroom if I were writing things up. Uh, some of this I would be writing up on a board. Some would be nicely presented on a screen. Some would be presented on the on the board and would be written like this. So you get to see my sloppy little handwriting there. But I think it brings a little more of the classroom type feel to the to the videos. And what we're going to talk about today is energy generation in the sun. Now how the sun produces its energy is very important because the sun is the source of all of essentially the source of all energy on earth. So this is where all energy on earth comes from. Almost, not quite. We can ignore, for example, nuclear power. Nuclear power is not generated from the is not generated directly from the sun. It was generated from elements that were produced in stars that formed and exploded long before the sun even formed. But everything else we use, coal and oil and gas, are really directly related to stored solar energy from plants and animals that died many millions of years ago and have been buried beneath the surface of the earth and their their organic material as it decayed was formed into the oil and the coal that we use today. We also use things like solar energy directly, which is directly used harnessing the sun's energy. Wind energy, water energy are all driven by the sun. If the sun had not been there, we wouldn't have any of those sources of energy. The only thing there would be nuclear power. Now the sun produces energy by what we call nuclear fusion. Now this is also in contrast to what we use on Earth and nuclear power plants actually use on Earth we use nuclear fission. So that's how we produce nuclear power on Earth by fission. Fusion is bringing things together So bringing atoms together and fission is splitting atoms apart. So that is how we go about it on Earth. We can take uranium and split it into smaller elements and that releases energy. Which we can then use to power things on the earth. Nuclear fusion is again another method that can be used that brings atoms together under extremely high temperatures and pressures. So one of the difficulties with nuclear fusion for us here on earth is that it requires extremely high temperatures and pressures. How hot? We're talking at the center of the sun it is about 15 million degrees and requires temperatures of at least 10 million in order to be hot enough to overcome the repulsion that the atoms feel for each other. So because they are similarly charged, they don't want to combine together. And we'll look at that in a little more detail here coming up on the next page. But this is why we're studying solar energy production, energy generation. How do we produce energy in the sun? It is the source of all energy on Earth, and we can get a better understanding of it. 
Now, the method that is used for the producing energy in the sun is what we call the proton-proton chain. And that ends up, and that starts off, it's a big chain of, of things, and we're going to look at it here. But essentially, you start off with two protons. So this is a proton and a proton. Now, if you recall, each of those protons has a positive charge. So that's positively charged, and that's positively charged. Like charges do not want to become close together. As they try to go close together, if we send them close together at a slow speed, their repulsion will kick in, and they won't combine. They'll just move away from each other. The positive charges repel. We need them moving at extremely high speed so that they can actually collide and have a chance to stick together. So, so we need them moving at high speeds tells us that we need extremely high temperatures. So what we have is that we move them at high speeds we can actually collide them together and form another particle which is called deuterium. So we're not we're, we're on the long run we're going to take hydrogen and we're going to form it into helium. So we should put that up here. Let's put that up at the top. That's our net result. That's what we're looking for. Is we're going to take four hydrogen atoms and convert them into one helium atom. But we're only starting out. It has to, it happens in steps. You can't just get four hydrogen atoms and smash them all together at once. Two atoms is e is easy. You can smash two things together. Trying to get three to smash simultaneously is even harder. And four is nearly impossible, even at the pressures and densities that we have at the center of the sun. So let's see what we've got in here. We started with hydrogen. This is essentially one hydrogen atom. This is a hydrogen atom. Deuterium is a form of hydrogen that is has one proton and one neutron. So this is hydrogen with just one proton. This has hydrogen with one proton and one neutron. Now, if you recall here, so deuterium is positively charged, one positive charge. So we have a positive charge, two positive charges going in and one going out. Well, that's not quite possible. We can't lose a charge. So we have to have some other particle coming out of here, and that's what we call so one particle coming out in addition to the deuterium being formed, it sends out a positron. So another thing, in this case, this is a positron, which is an anti-electron. So it sends out a positron, and it also has to send. It also sends out another particle called a neutrino. So it sends out a neutrino, which has no charge, and it has sends out a positron, which has a positive charge. And in fact, we're going to do one thing here. We're going to change that just to make it stand out a little bit better. Let's do that here in a different color. We'll do the positron there. So it's a positive, but that's a positron. It's an anti-electron. Now, if you recall, antimatter and matter don't like each other. So this, this quickly meets a traditional electron. So it'll almost immediately this combines with an electron and that electron has a negative charge and when those two combine that gives off energy so the positron will annihilate itself almost immediately with an electron and then send out gamma rays so then we will have that will produce 
right here will send off gamma rays. Gamma rays are extremely high energy, so very, very high energy particles, and that produces a lot of the energy in the sun right there. The neutrino particle escapes. It escapes directly from the center of the sun and heads off to Earth. The other, the, ener the energy that's produced here takes a long time to get out. The neutrinos don't interact with anything once they form, and they zip right out to the Earth. We're going to talk a little bit about those more on the next page. But the first step in the proton-proton chain takes two protons, smashes them together to form deuterium, which is one proton and one neutron stuck together. So you stick these two together. One of the charges essentially comes off as a positron or an anti-electron, which produces energy in the form of gamma rays. And the neutrino. Now, we do this two times. If we do this a couple of times, then we can act or we can do this again we form so we have deuterium so now our next step in the chain is we're starting with the deuterium atom we're going to do this in steps so we start off with the deuterium here with a positive charge so we have our deuterium atom oops So here's deuterium. And now we're going to combine that with another proton. So we're going to take another proton here with a positive charge. And we're going to combine those two together. And we're going to form something else. We're going to form a isotope of helium. So we're almost to where we wanted to be. We're going to form an isotope of helium that we call helium-3. This has two positive charges and this is what we call helium-3 which has two protons and one neutron. So essentially all we did here was we took the deuterium and we smashed a proton into it and they all stuck together. So we don't need a lot of other things. We don't need, there's, there's no charge difference. We have two charges, two positive charges coming in, two positive charges coming out. So we don't need anything else like as we did needed our positron forming in this case. So we form helium. But this isn't helium, this isn't the normal helium. The normal helium is helium-4. So we're going to do that. We're going to take two of these helium-3 nuclei and we're going to smash them together. So our final step is to take two of these helium-3 nuclei, which as you recall had two positive charges, and we're then going to smash them together and form helium-4. This is the traditional helium that we're used to. Again it has two positive charges so it's still 2 plus and it has two protons and two neutrons. So let's see what's happened here. We've had four charges go four positive charges going in and only two coming out. We still need two more positive charges coming out of here. So coming away from this, we also have two protons. So we're going to have two protons come back out at very high speeds to begin the process again. So these will be able to go be able to take these two protons and go back and begin the process once again. And we formed helium. So the net result is that we have taken four hydrogen atoms and smashed them together. 
we had we had a couple hydrogens here to form the deuterium. The deuterium added another hydrogen to form helium three. Then the two helium three smashed together to form helium four. And then we have our nice stable helium there that's not going to do much of anything else for right now. And that's the helium right here that we found. So we've taken in a number of steps, and I know this can be a confusing process. I tried to explain it here a little bit differently, and hopefully watching as I go through it helps with looking at the material in the textbook when it's just a static picture there. Give you something a little bit more dynamic to look at and try to understand this a little bit better. And then these uh, the protons that come out at the end form, go back into the cycle and continue forming again. So we'll continue form of more deuterium and continue this process. This process on the sun will last 10 billion years. This will take 10 billion years for the sun to convert all of its hydrogen into helium. So it'll take 10 billion years for all of the hydrogen to be converted to helium. Then the sun will have to go on through its evolution. We'll talk about that at another time. But for 10 billion years, this process, this proton-proton chain, is able to serve, provide energy to the sun. Now I want to come back to one more topic that we mentioned, and that was this little neutrino here. Neutrino, little neutral one, as it's called. And that is a very interesting topic, and I want to go and talk about a little bit about what we call, have called or used to call the neutrino problem. What the neutrino problem was, was that, as I told you, the neutrino escapes directly from the center of the sun. So it gets right out from the center of the sun. That is a good test. It does not interact with anything. So it does not like to interact. It just zips through all that, all that sun and just blazes right through it and goes right through and right to the Earth or to wherever it happens to be heading in space. So it escapes directly. It's a look in. It's essentially a look into the core. So we can see if we can detect some of these neutrinos, you know, one in a billion, one in a trillion, even less, we can learn something about the core of the sun that we can't see. The other, the energy, the gamma rays that were produced can take many million, can take thousands, millions of years to work their way out through the layers of the sun. It can take a very long time for them to work their way out. Here is a direct look into the core of the sun. And experiments were set up to te detect these neutrinos. I told you they don't interact well. They interact on very rare occasions. Most of them will blaze through things very, very quickly. But every once in a while they interact. So large tanks of cleaning fluid were set up to detect these neutrinos. And they were put well below the surface of the Earth. And when we detected them, we found that we were only detecting we were only detecting a small fraction we only detected one-third of the neutrinos expected. Wow, that's a problem. We only detected one-third of what we expected. That's a big difference. It's not like saying we expected to detect, detect 100 and we only detected 99 or we detected 101. We were expecting to detect 100. We only detected 33. That's a big difference. So that gave us possibilities, one of two possibilities. And one was, maybe we don't understand how the sun generates it and energy. Maybe our model of the soul of the sun is wrong. Maybe that is the problem. Or, number two, Maybe we don't understand the neutrino.
maybe we don't understand the neutrino exactly, and maybe there's something with that that we could better understand. And it was found out a little bit later that the neutrino actually oscillates. And it oscillates between what we call three different flavors. So it was three flavors. No, they don't taste different. But three different flavors. And our experiments were only, detect, only set up to detect one of these three. So three flavors. But the experiment that we used was only detecting one type. Once we understood that better, then that means we would expect to only detect a third of the neutrinos. So these are then correct. So we were actually did understand it. No, our understanding of the solar energy generation was not wrong. We believe we now do understand how the sun generates its energy and that our models of the temperatures and pressures of the sun are correct. We, what was the problem was we didn't completely understand the neutrino at the time. And the neutrino changed between these three different flavors. We were only set up to detect one type. We couldn't detect the other two, so they went through undetected, therefore leaving us only detecting one third of the type. But I like to use this even though this problem, this former problem has been solved and we now do understand it. It's still an interesting study in how we learn about objects, how science works in terms of trying to understand the different methods, what different methods we can use and how we can understand different processes that are occurring. So this video again was to talk to you a little bit about the energy generation in the sun and we talked about that as the source of all the energy on the earth in terms of except for the nuclear power and the main portion of this was trying to give you a basic a little bit sort of an emphasis on the proton proton chain. How does the sun actually produce? How does it actually take four hydrogen atoms and smash them together to form one helium atom? When we talk about that in general you tend to think, take four hydrogen atoms, smash them all together, and make a helium. In reality, it actually goes in steps. And that's what you're seeing here. That's what I was showing you here. And then finally, just sort of as a study in the scientific method, looking at the neutrino problem. So how, how the neutrinos and the understanding of the neutrino that was produced in that very first step of the proton-proton chain. That's why it was a very big concern when we couldn't detect the right number of neutrinos. It was telling us we were concerned that this maybe was not going the way we thought it was. But it turns out that neutrinos have a pattern of oscillation. They can change different types. And we were only detecting one of them. So there was no neutrino problem. The neutrinos were perfectly normal. We just didn't understand them completely. So I hope this has helped you a little bit with the proton-proton chain especially. I know that can be a confusing topic and it is an interesting one. It's good to try to understand exactly the method by which the sun does generate its energy. So again, I'll be recording a few more of these videos on several other different topics to try to help and better understand them as, we go through, as you go through the course and you can use them to come back to a review. So hopefully they've been helpful. And until next time, I will see you in class.